everyone and welcome to the Harvard Divinity School um, HDS Overview Application Requirements and Best Practices event. My name is Margaret Okada Shek and I'm the Associate Director of Admissions. And I'm Sarah Guzzi. I'm an Assistant Director of Admissions here at the Divinity School and I'm also an HDS alum. I graduated in 2015 with the MTS in Gender, Sexuality and Religion. So uh, we are going today to talk a little bit about HDS. So we're going to shut off our video so you can uh, see the PowerPoint. All right, so as we get started, I wanted to provide an overview of HDS. We are located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and HDS is one of Harvard's 12 graduate and professional schools. HDS was founded in 1816 and is the most religiously pluralistic divinity school in the world, representing over 30 faith traditions, including students who aren't affiliated with any faith tradition. HDS brings together scholars of religion in conversation with religious practitioners as both learning partners and community members. Our degree programs lead to infinite pathways with alums in every field and industry who value ethical leadership, religious literacy, and service-oriented, mission-driven work. To give you a snapshot of the community here at HDS, this is the class profile of our fall 2020 incoming class uh, who have just joined the rest of the HDS student body. So we have 90 incoming MTS students, 44 MDiv students, and one THM student. In this incoming class, 52% identify as women, 32% as male, and 16% as non-binary. The average age is 25 and the age range of the students goes from 20 through 56. Our incoming class represents over 30 different religious affiliations. Students of color comprise 36% of the class and international students make up another 14%. In addition, we have 99 colleges and universities represented in the incoming class, which means that we have students coming in from a really diverse array of institutions and academic trainings. We offer four degree programs and one non-degree program, which we will discuss now. The MDiv is a three-year degree that combines rigorous academics with experiential education with two required units of field education available in a wide variety of settings, both locally and globally. The MDiv originally prepared students for parish ministry, and it still does for those who are, who <clears throat> are pursuing that vocation but today fewer than 40% of MDiv graduates pursue that path. We conceive of ministry broadly, and some students in the MDiv are interested in ministry with a lowercase m. Ministry defined as service and commitment to interreligious and understanding and dialogue applicable to any career. The MDiv is a necessary credential for those interested in ordination in a faith tradition or chaplaincy. Other MDiv graduates pursue a wide range of fields where ethical leadership and interfaith competency would be an asset. The next is our Master of Theological Studies program, which is a two-year degree program that is uh, incredibly flexible. Students select one of 18 different areas of focus. They take six areas within that area focus and three courses outside of it to gain both depth and breadth. There is one required course, Theories and Methods in the Study of Religion, as well as a language requirement. The rest of the courses are electives and students tailor the program as they see fit, with guidance from their advisor. A thesis in the second year is optional and some MTS students opt to do a field education placement, which is required for the MDiv, but not for the MTS. In, ad in addition to academia, this program prepares students for careers in a wide range of fields any field that would benefit from an understanding of how it intersects with religion and spirituality. The THM is a one-year program and applicants must already hold an MDiv. THM applicants also select one of the 18 areas of focus. It is not designed to be the fourth year of an MDiv or as a year of further doctoral program preparation, but rather is best undertaken by folks who have been doing ministry in the world, again, broadly defined, and are now interested in exploring a topic in great depth to clarify their thinking or delve into a new topic that impacts their ministry, whatever that may look like. Note there is no funding available for, for this program. Here are the 18 different areas of focus. MTS applicants select one during the application process. 
Most applicants are interested in more than one area of focus. And of course, there are so many ways in which these overlap. So pick the one that makes the most sense when you apply. And it's easy to change once you're at H HDS if you realize another area of focus makes more sense. For example, we have students studying Buddhist studies, not only in the Buddhist studies area of focus, but also in the South Asian religious traditions, comparative studies, East Asian religions, women, gender, sexuality, and religion, and more. It all depends on how you want to situate yourself in the field and frame the work that you're doing. MDiv applicants do not formally declare an area of focus or a faith tradition, but seeing the areas of focus can help clarify the strengths of the HDS program. This is the Master of Religion in Public Life, which is our recently launched degree program here at Harvard Divinity School. This is a one year degree program designed for those who are already experienced professionals in their careers who wish to develop in depth knowledge of how their field and religion intersect. The MRPL degree provides an opportunity for mid career journalists, government officials, humanitarian aid workers, educators, artists, healthcare professionals, lawyers, and other practitioners to become leaders in their fields who can help foster a better public understanding of religion. Professionals will gain an advanced knowledge about religion through coursework, a shared seminar with other professionals, and a final project. Note that there is no funding available for this program. The Special Student Status is a non-degree program for those who are interested in taking courses for academic credit but don't need to undertake a degree program. It might also be a good option for someone whose academic record doesn't match their abilities or they are making a career change and wish to bolster their application before applying to a degree program. Special student status allows students to take up to eight courses in up to two years for academic credit and pay on a per course basis. And now that we've spoken about the degree programs, we will talk about the resources of Harvard Divinity School. So here we have a photo of the faculty at HDS helmed by Dean David N. Hempton in the blue at the front. The faculty of HDS is comprised of 38 voting faculty, 72 other lecturers offering instruction, 12 denominational counselors, and nine faculty emeriti. In addition to incredible courses, faculty offer academic advising to all master's students. Students are assigned a faculty advisor before they matriculate, but your official faculty advisor isn't the only faculty you'll form a relationship with. Faculty are happy to meet with students and provide guidance and mentorship. I was pleasantly surprised by how accessible the HDS faculty is when I arrived here as a student. If you have specific faculty you're interested in working with, they may or may not be able to connect with you as a prospective student, but the flip side of that is that faculty are quite available to both admitted and current students. If you do elect to contact a faculty member with any questions before you apply, my advice is to keep your email short and ask specific questions. Here are a handful of the denominational counselors that I mentioned in the last slide. Denominational counselors often teach religious or denominationally specific courses and are available as a resource to students, whether it's for guidance, selecting courses, or advice on pursuing ordination in that specific denomination in conjunction with the MDiv. Check out the complete list of denominational counselors on our website, which includes their email addresses, and feel free to contact them to learn more about what resources in their specific denomination or faith tradition are available to HDS students. HDS has five affiliated programs and centers. The Center for the Study of World Religions, the Women's Studies and Religion Program, Religion and Public Life, the Pluralism Project, and the Program for the Evolution of Spirituality. This last one is a brand new program spearheaded by Dr. Dan McCannon, and it supports the scholarly study of emerging spiritual movements, marginalized spiritualities, and the quote, innovative edges of established religious traditions. It also prepares students for ministry in these movements. There is an inaugural conference planned for spring 2021 entitled Ecological Spiritualities, which will explore the evolution of Earth-based spiritual traditions and highlight innovative spiritual practices that are emerging in response to climate change and the disruption of local and global ecosystems. 
All of the programs and centers at HDS are doing really phenomenal and interesting work, and I wish we had time to talk about each of them in depth, but that would be a whole hour-long presentation in and of itself. So I'll just highlight one more, the Women's Studies and Religion Program, which is run by Dr. Ann Browdy. This program brings five scholars from around the world to HDS every year to work on a book project at the intersection of religion and gender. These visiting scholars each teach a one-off course at HDS, as well as give a lecture about their research, which allows HDS students to be exposed to incredible faculty and research, as well as unique courses that are only offered once. Note that many of these centers hire HDS students to work as research assistants, so do keep that in mind should you end up at HDS. On the right side of this slide is a tiny fraction of the wide range of centers and programs that exist across Harvard, either as university-wide centers or housed in other graduate schools. There is cutting edge research and work happening at many of these, and HDS students have access to the resources of these centers. Many of these centers have funding available too. Many HDS students have secured funding for summer field education, internships, or January term experiences from centers and programs across the university, including the Center for Latin American Studies, the South Asia Institute, and many more. There were 230 HDS courses offered last year, and HDS students also have access to courses across the entire university, as well as throughout the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium, or the BTI. This is a consortium of 10 theological institutions of higher education in the Boston area. The BTI offers easy cross-registration at no additional cost, access to the libraries at all of the member institutions, funding for student-led conferences, and certificate programs. For MDiv and MTS students, 50% of your coursework can actually be completed outside of HDS, so students truly can customize their HDS experience to create their unique path through the program and get the preparation that each student needs for their goals. And if none of the thousands of courses available to you fit the bill, you can also work directly with HDS faculty to do an independent study. It's safe to say that no two HDS students have the same transcript. The Summer Language Program, or SLP, is offered each summer. SLP combines two academic semesters into a fast-paced, intensive eight-week course. You can see the list of languages that are available for this coming summer on the slide. One great thing about SLP is that it's available to incoming HDS students too, so you can actually enroll the summer before you officially matriculate meaning that if you apply this year to start at HDS in fall 2021, you can take SLP this summer, coming summer, which is a great way to get some language credits under your belt, especially for those of you considering doctoral work down the line. Now that we've talked about the academic features of life at HDS, let's talk a bit about what the community is like. So we're often asked about what it's like to be a student at HDS and what extracurricular opportunities are available. The next slides will showcase many of the ways in which HDS students are involved outside of the classroom. The Harvard Divinity School Student Association, or the HDSSA, is a group of elected students who meet regularly with staff in the Office of Student Life. The HDSSA manages dispersing funds to student organizations, coordinates annual events such as the Solidarity Ball, which raises money for a local organization, manages subcommittees on a range of topics, and really serves as a resource for students. The Office of Student Life also supports over 35 student organizations every year, and it's really easy to start your own if there's something that doesn't exist that you think should exist. Some examples of student organizations are Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, which is where the famous podcast of the same name emerged from, the HDS Prison Education Project, the HDS Garden Group, the HDS Low Income Student Advocates, and Third Chapter, a group for students over 50. These student organizations host over 60 student-led events each year, in addition to the over 500 recurring events, which include weekly worship services hosted by faith-based student organizations. Um, the photo that you see here is from the third annual Black Religion, Spirituality, and Culture Conference hosted by Harambe, a group for students of African descent this past year. This conference brought together scholars and students from a wide range of institutions, as well as from outside of academia. There are three student-run publications at HDS, as well as a handful of other publications that feature student work, which are facilitated by various offices across the school. 
The Office of Student Life coordinates two weekly school-wide events. Noon service takes place each Wednesday at noon, and student organizations take turn hosting and invite the entire community to join in their rituals and worship. This is often faith-based organizations, but non-faith-based organizations such as Queer Rights, that's R-I-T-E-S, and Women's Circle also host noon service each year as well. Community tea is a time for the community to gather around food each week on Tuesday afternoons with no agenda and is a great way to catch up with friends, staff, and faculty. And finally, in addition to the robust offerings at HDS, you can consider joining groups that are Harvard-wide, often identity-based groups, or groups housed in other Harvard graduate schools. Now that we've talked about what it's like to be a student at HDS, let's turn to what people do after HDS. This data is from a 2019 survey who, uh, of alumni who had been out of HDS for one, five, and 10 years who were asked to report about their current career fields. It's a little tough to see, so I'll, I'll read it out for you. Orange indicates MTS graduates and yellow is MDiv. As you, as you may be able to see, the single highest percentage is 27% for MTS graduates who work in education, secondary school, or other educational fields. For MDivs, 26% is the highest concentration of alumni in a single field, showing those who are in ordained ministry. The next highest percentage for either degree program is 20%, which shows what an incredibly wide range of fields our graduates go into, which include writing, public policy or government, nonprofit management or consulting, law, medicine, and community development or advocacy. The flexibility of the programs, as we discussed earlier, maps onto the fact that our students head off into so many different fields. The crucial thing to keep in mind is that because HDS can prepare folks for such an array of options, it's important to have a sense of what you want to do post HDS when you apply so that you can be strategic about crafting your path through the program. To further illustrate the range of jobs our graduates have, Here's a sampling of job titles taken directly from our 2018 alumni survey. As you can see, they span a wide range of careers. So now, so now we will talk about two recent alumni who just graduated and what they're doing now. This is Salvador Pena, who graduated this past May from Harvard Divinity School. Salvador is from the Dominican Republic and had a career in global shipping and logistics before he got his Master of Arts in International Development from Georgetown. After Georgetown, he worked at the, U yeah, at the World Bank, but still felt like his desire to serve others wasn't being met, so he decided to apply to HDS. At HDS, he studied ethics, leadership, and counseling, and he, and he has just moved to Panama and started a job working on COVID-19 relief operations with the UN's World Food Program. While at HDS, one of Salvador's field ed placements was with an organization in Argentina called El Arca Argentina, which helps people with intellectual disabilities to flourish. One of his tasks there was to teach meditation. As his capstone project at HDS, Salvador took that experience and developed a meditation program at a place where he, had already, he was already volunteering, Y2Y Harvard Square, a homeless shelter founded and staffed by Harvard students that helps young adults. Eventually, Salvador hopes to return to the Dominican Republic and run for public office. The other recent graduate we'd like to highlight is Naja Zigby Johnson. Originally from Harlem, Naja attended Guilford College in North Carolina. While she was there, she worked as a fundraising fellow with a local nonprofit. After college, she worked in philanthropy at a foundation for one year in New York. At HDS, Naja studied Black diasporic religious traditions, and she recently started a new job as Director for Institutional Advancement at the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Education Center in Harlem. At HDS, Naja also created an HDS course entitled Freedom School, a seminar on theory and praxis for Black studies in the United States. She did this in partnership with the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard. 15 students and greater Boston community members enrolled in Freedom School, which was grounded in the legacy of the nationwide effort to, during the civil rights movement to mobilize African Americans in the struggle for social, political, and economic equality, and engages popular education pedagogy to co-build and participate in a self-designed course for collaborative learning. This summer, Naja released the stu a student-published Freedom School literary magazine, 
created by the course participants, which you can find online at freedomschool-litmag.com. Now that we've highlighted two profiles of recent alums, we'd like to tell you about two alums who are further out from their time at HDS and who have careers that you may not automatically associate with Divinity School. Inez Wu studied the sociology of religion in undergrad, but wasn't sure if academia was the right career for her. She came to HDS because she could further her academic studies in the sociology of religion, while also exploring non-academic career options, including ministry. Inez was also excited about the opportunity to cross-register at other Harvard schools and took many courses at the Harvard Law School and Harvard Kennedy School, delving into the intersections of church and state and religious influence on international conflicts. After HDS, Inez pursued a JD from Harvard Law School and worked as a lawyer in finance. Her current position is as an executive in the hedge fund industry. Inez credits HDS for providing her with leadership skills that the modern business world needs, being holistic, caring, and able to approach the world with a humanitarian and practical view. Kevin Cranston came to HDS with a lifelong academic interest in the human experience of faith, spirituality, textual tradition, and ritual practice, and he studied theology during his undergrad years at Boston College. His primary motivation for attending HDS, however, was to prepare to work on the local impact of the HIV AIDS pandemic. Kevin wanted to work on the long haul response to the pandemic and be useful to his community. At HDS, Kevin studied a wide range of topics with a concentration in pastoral counseling and organizational development. After HDS, Kevin worked in the nonprofit human services sector and then moved into government work which he found was the perfect environment for using his analytic and ethical training from HDS, specifically in the field of public health policy and practice. He currently serves as the director of the Bureau of Infectious Diseases and Laboratory Sciences in the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Kevin reflects on and utilizes his MDiv training every day and says that it formed and continues to inform the professional that he is today. Now that we've talked about alumni, let's talk about where we physically are. Cambridge and Boston is an incredible place to be a graduate student. There are a lot of academic institutions across the city that offer incredible access to academic, professional, and cultural opportunities to engage in. It's a small city which makes it walkable and has tons of things happening, whether you're interested in sports, the arts, museums, outdoor activities, there are loads to do in the immediate and local area. One of the challenges of being in Boston and Cambridge, however, is the cost of living. Therefore, let's turn to how you might fund your HDS experience. We are now going to talk about the financial aid that we offer here at HDS. HDS offers generous financial aid. 90% of students receive funding, and this is available for the MTS and MDiv programs. We put the vast majority of our financial aid funding into need-based aid in order to get the most money to the most people who need it. And therefore, we strongly encourage everyone to submit a financial aid application so you can be considered for need-based aid. There are three levels of need-based aid, as you can see on the slide. Our baseline package is a 75% tuition grant. So as you're planning for graduate school and thinking about your budget, that's a good number to use. For folks with more need, we offer a 100% tuition grant. And then for the folks with the most need, our largest grant offers 100% tuition coverage plus an annual living stipend. This is renewable for the length of your program. We also offer merit awards to approximately 10% of the incoming class. And this funding is available for the MTS and MDiv programs as well. Merit awards cover full tuition and provide an annual living stipend. All applicants are considered for merit awards. There is no one magical formula to get merit awards and there is nothing additional you need to do for this. All you have to focus on is submitting a strong application for admission. But again, the vast majority of our funding is need-based. So please make sure to apply for financial aid. On that note, let's turn now to the application for admission. Great, thanks Margaret. So let's discuss what's required, tips for putting forward a strong application, and the application timeline. We'll start with the application timeline. So it's currently available, um, the application to start in fall 2021. The deadline is coming up on January 7th, 2021. 
Um, and then after you submit your application in mid-January, you'll receive the financial aid application information. And that has a deadline of February 16th, 2021. So make sure that you look out for that and let us know if you don't receive that. In mid-March, we'll release our admissions decisions. If you are admitted, then within 24 hours of getting that admissions decision, you'll also get your financial aid package. So you'll have all of that info right at the beginning. And um, then you'll have about a month to let us know if you're coming or not, because the response deadline is April 15th. So this is what's required for the application. We have an online application form, an application fee of $25. And if that represents a financial hardship for you, we do have an application fee waiver um, and see the application instructions for information about how to get that. We require a resume, transcripts, three letters of recommendation, a statement of purpose, a writing sample, and then TOEFL or IELTS scores if applicable. We'll talk next about approaching the process. So as you begin thinking about it, here are some things to keep in mind. First of all, start early. Give yourself plenty of time to get all of your ducks in a row. There may be some delays that are out of your hands. Recommenders taking a while to get in their recommendations, delays getting your transcripts, especially now during the pandemic. So allowing yourself ample time to collect your application materials, write your statement of purpose, and work with your recommenders will definitely take some of the stress out of the process. Another thing to think about now is to build your team. No one applies to graduate school alone. You have three recommenders, your family, your friends, folks who will read through your application materials to catch any typos, etc. Think through who the people will be who will be really supporting you throughout this process. Expect a holistic review. We look at your entire application. There is no minimum GPA or no required major that you need to have studied in undergrad. We truly want to get a sense of who you are, what your accomplishments are, and that you'll thrive at HDS. Think about your application materials as a whole rather than as individual components. Is there something in one aspect of your application that should be highlighted again in another? Is there something crucial we should know about you that actually isn't present anywhere in your application? Take a macro view of your application materials as you're collecting them. And then finally, prepare your academic profile. This means all of the ways in which you show us that you have academic strengths and that you'll be successful in the courses of HDS. This includes your transcripts, as well as your academic writing sample, your statement of purpose, your academic letters of recommendation, along with any other academic accomplishments you have on your resume. Again, think holistically about the ways in which we're getting this information about you. Perhaps your undergrad GPA doesn't really accurately reflect your, uh, your academic abilities. So make sure that some other component of your academic profile does then. This could be a really strong academic letter of recommendation or two, and making sure that your writing sample is an academic writing sample and is really polished and strong. All right, letters of recommendation. This might seem obvious, but ask people who know you well. We are much more interested in getting a letter from someone who can really give us specifics and speak to your strengths rather than a recommender who might have a fancy title, but who really doesn't know you as well and can only provide generic positive feedback. Make sure to have conversations with the recommenders you select so that they understand the program you're applying to, why you're applying, and anything in particular that you hope they can speak to in their letter. You actually have more control over this than you might think. Giving lots of info to your recommenders can really help them write well on your behalf. Be sure to give them a copy of your statement of purpose and resume as well. And again, please give them plenty of time. The application deadline is in early January, so don't wait until December to ask them. And again, think holistically about your recommenders. Find folks who can highlight different strengths or who know you in different ways. This is, of course, dependent on each applicant's situation. Someone applying specifically to pursue doctoral work in the future might be best served by having three strong academic recommenders, and then this advice isn't as important in that situation. So really think about your own situation and goals and who might be able to provide insight into who you are as a potential graduate student. And if you're applying to the MDiv program, we do want to get one letter of recommendation from someone who can speak to your ministerial potential. And remember here that we're talking about ministry with a lowercase m, very broadly defined. So it can be someone who can speak to your career goals, which will be served by the MDiv program specifically. It doesn't have to be a religious professional or leader. 
While we think holistically about the application, the statement of purpose is hands down the most important component of your application. This is your opportunity to really tell us who you are, why you want to attend HDS, what resources you'll utilize at HDS, name drop those faculty you wanna work with, mention those programs or centers you're excited about that jumped out at you on the earlier slide about that, and speak to what your goals are post HDS broadly. We know that not everyone knows exactly what they wanna do after grad school, but because our degrees are so flexible, it is important to show that you have a strong sense of what you hope to get out of your HDS experience. Be sure to highlight your accomplishments. We shouldn't learn everything amazing about you just from your recommenders. Tell us why you're great. I know it can feel uncomfortable to talk about that, but try to power through as it will help us really get a good understanding of who you are. And please, please, please edit this carefully and have other folks review it for typos. While submitting a statement of purpose with a typo isn't going to make or break your application, having a carefully edited statement shows us that you've really taken care with your application. And then crucially, be authentic. Please don't tell us what you think we wanna hear. We can actually see through that. Just be genuine and honest. All right, the writing sample. This component of the application is your chance to show us what a stellar writer you are. You can use a piece of academic writing you might have from a previous class or an excerpt from a longer piece. If you've been out of school for a while or are coming from a totally different field, you might wanna consider writing something new for this. Uh, if you're choosing an excerpt, I would suggest looking for something that shows your ability to do critical analysis. And then we often get a ton of questions asking for more specifics like, is it okay to write a paragraph at the beginning of an excerpt to provide context? Um, and is it okay to include footnotes or citations? The answer is yes and yes. This um, part of your application is actually really open-ended on purpose. So we just wanna see your strong writing, whatever that might be. So use your best judgment here. Okay, so, so you're interested in HDS, what should you do now? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here are some ways to stay connected to HDS. Um, so we have a ton more virtual events throughout the fall. We hope that you'll be joining us. Um, we really strongly encourage everyone to connect with a current HDS student by emailing um, our ask underscore students account. Uh, those are manned by our graduate admissions ambassadors and they're fantastic at pairing students uh, that might have a similar background or interest. Um, we have a really wonderful blog um, that um, has a ton of wonderful information, both about the application process as well as life at HDS. So we encourage you all to check it out. Um, and our Instagram um, account is incredibly robust. So that's also a, a fantastic way to um, find more information. And then finally, please contact us at admissions at hds.harvard.edu um, with any specific questions that you may have in regard to the process. Um, we thank you so much for your time and for joining us. And um, we hope that you'll stay in touch. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, thank you.